good guys or bad guys? We'll find out this week on Motoring 98. TSN's Motoring 98 is brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will, and Midas for new longer lasting performance friction carbon metallic brake pads. This is the brand new Hummer, and the people at Hummer believe it's the best one yet. In fact, they're so confident they've offered a challenge to Motoring 98. Hello everybody, we'll talk more about the Hummer later on, but first we're going to chat about the enjoyment of driving until you have a mechanical breakdown away from home on a busy or lonely highway. And unless Bill Gardner is riding with you, you're probably going to have to phone for a tow truck. Now some would say you're just setting yourself up to be ripped off. Is that true? Well, let's see if we can find an answer. They position themselves along the 401, Canada's busiest highway. Parked at the side of the road or perched on the ramps, they monitor the police airwaves, waiting for an accident or a stranded motorist. Last year alone, 60,000 accidents were reported in metropolitan Toronto. That spells big business for tow truck operators. The tow truck is usually the first vehicle at the scene to help the motorist out of a sometimes dangerous situation. So why does the industry have such a shabby reputation? Why are these guys called vultures and bandits instead of good Samaritans? Well, I think most people hate us um, because they read things about us. I don't think people dislike us because of they've had a bad experience. Uh, maybe 1% of what's done is bad. Um, private property towing. People don't like that. People don't like the towing where the uh, pounds take your cars from the tollway zones downtown. So they blame the whole industry. I started towing 24 years ago. Um, same street, same area. Um, I started chasing accidents, as the media puts it. <laughs> so I am one of those chasers. And we've made our living helping people on the highway. They think we're bandits. So you're stuck in the ditch and you got, we got to pull you out in the middle of a snowstorm. Then they love you. And then after that they have a different feeling of us. But till they meet us, they, they just think we're all bad guys. Basically it's a seven day a week job. A lot of us can't afford not to sit at home anymore. We have to come out and work. And it's just a problem all the time. We're not appreciated anymore. And you get a little fed up after a while. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, we have a PD accident. At they scan everything. They scan OPP, they scan us. Everything that goes over the air, they hear it. And I've seen 10, 12 trucks and one car, maybe two cars to go to be towed, okay? And then lots of times the OPP have to tell them to move on. So, you know. And the motors, what do they do? Well, the motors, they get kind of confused too because they, you know, the, the driver is saying, well, I'll tow your car and, uh, Maybe the gentleman don't want to have his car towed by them, but he's so confused that, okay, hook it, and you know. Well, the business over the years, um, it's it's changed in such a way that there's there's more trucks out there, but uh, I think the one of the reasons for for quite the increase in in the amount of trucks is the fact that uh, people are out there cruising the highways, uh, they're very much interested in, in picking up cars that have been involved in collisions and, and taking them to body shops for finders fees, which is not what we do, by the way. Sure we do. Um, it's never been a secret. Um, yeah, tow truck driver can't survive on a $30, $40 or $50 tow bill. They can't survive even on $150. You have $60,000 trucks. If they couldn't get any type of a commission from a body shop, 
Okay, they would have to tow maybe 10 cars a day to cover their costs. The chaser is lucky if he tows maybe four or five a month. So at $150, wouldn't even cover the insurance on a truck. Okay, $3,000 is average a year for a truck in the city, some as high as five. The body shops love the tow truck driver. Uh, most of them wouldn't survive without us. This guy's car, he's got motor problems. He got stuck in a live lane back there, okay? So now that's you all seen him. They pushed him off with a bumper, got him off here in a safe spot. They put it over the radio, first available tow truck. And I come along and I got the toll because I'm the first truck on scene. Now what, like, what do you charge him now? What, what do you do? It's forty-five dollars to hook it up. It's two dollars a kilometer plus GST. That's it. All right. So what okay. are you taking him? Wherever he wants to go. It's up to the owner. It's the owner's choice. You've got long hair. You've got an earring. Mm -hmm. Semi beard. Leather. You're the guy that everybody's supposed to be scared of. Well. We're not the guys you guys should be scared of, okay? Like, we're out here to do a job like anybody else. We could be your best friends. We're here to help everybody and get them on their way as quick as possible. We know all the body shops, we know all the mechanical shops. We're here to suit whatever need you have. If you're stuck on the, on the side of the road and, and you, can't get to that, uh, you can't get that towing company to come out or you, or you don't have a phone or you can't get to a phone, before you jump in a tow truck, always find out how much is it going to cost? Get a price, firm up the deal. Do they take credit cards? Uh, any businessman in this day and age not only takes one credit card, but takes two or three credit cards. If you're in doubt of anything that anyone's telling you, tell them to put it in writing. Anybody who won't put it in writing and sign their name to it, they're lying to you. So when the, if you go to a tow truck driver and he says he'll tow you for $30, get a bill from him, have him sign it, Get your copy, right? Just make sure you know exactly what you're getting before you start. If he doesn't do that, then he's lying. Don't deal with him. Same with us. If we're not willing to say this is where we're going to do for you and this is what you're going to get, and if I'm not willing to sign my name, I'm lying. Right? Or just tell that guy to leave. Deal with somebody else. Indeed, there's acres of legroom, and considering the very fast rake of the rear window, <laughs> That'll be my jacket. <laughs> On this edition of Test Drive, we take a look at the 1999 version of the Pontiac Grand Am. Now the Grand Am has been a very important car for Pontiac because it's been their top seller. Is the rework right for the time? You're about to find out. Behind the pointy nose sits one of two engines. The base unit is a 2.4 litre four banger that's a distant relative of the old quad four. Normally I'd dismiss this engine but a tour around the block proved that its 150 horsepower is more than adequate. That said, if you're going to buy a Grand Am, it should be with the 3.4 litre V6. This engine ups the horsepower to 170 and delivers 195 pounds-feet of torque at just 4,000 RPM. Matt the pedal and the Grand Am scoops big time. Helping matters is the fact that the four-speed automatic is cooperative. The ratios are well spaced, it's willing to kick down and yet the shifts are almost undetectable. This combination really is first class. You know the thing that's always irked me about aircraft style doors, after it's been raining, all of the water that was sitting here drips down and soaks the seat. Sadly the Grand Am is no different. The Grand Am also lacks a water channel up the left side of the windshield. When the wipers are on and it's raining hard, everything that was here ends up here. For 99, GM have stuck an extra four inches into the wheelbase and almost three and a half inches into the width of the track. The result? A lot more interior room. There's acres of leg room and for a car with a very fast rear window, there's a surprising amount of headroom. When you move up front, you realize that the driver's environment is very much in keeping with the sporty image of the Grand Am. First of all, great set of gauges, at least during the day. Unfortunately, at night time, 
they bleed such a terrible blood red that they become too overpowering. That aside, radio and climate controls that sit in the right order and the smart stalk, well it's gone. You've now got a lever on either side of the steering column and the cruise controls, well they now sit on the steering wheel. The other comment, the top of the dash is anything but flat. I wonder what they use for the mold. The Grand Am is suspended by McPherson struts up front and a tri-link design in back. Both ends use roll bars. Combined, this setup delivers a crisp feel that does not beat you up on the commute to work. During the pylon test, the car tracked a true and easily controllable line. The nice part here is that the tyres feel well and truly stuck to the tarmac. While the suspension says sporty and the chunky feel imparted by the steering wheel again says sporty, the car doesn't feel it because the power steering is so overly boosted you get an artificial feel. This car needs a little more effort in the steering wheel to give it the feedback it cries out for. Stopping power comes from a new front disc rear drum design. In the past the brakes have been the single biggest weak link in the chain. Not so anymore. Compared to the previous design, the new system shortens the stopping distances by about 14%. In real terms, this equates to 109 feet from 80k. Factor in a decent pedal feel and an ABS system that does not intrude too early, and you have a very balanced system. You know, despite my criticisms, this 99 Grand Am is very close to being a Grand Slam for Pontiac. In short, it's a very worthy successor. Of more interest, though, is that Pontiac's just released the GT version, which uses Ram Air, and so you get more horsepower. So if you're looking for something a little more spirited than this thing, it may be worth the wait. Our Midas tip of the week concerns bump starting a car with a manual or standard transmission. Twice in the past year I've been collared by viewers of our show whose cars wouldn't start at a gas station. In both cases failed starter motors, but we got the car going by bump starting it. I'm going to show you how to do that. Remember this tip only applies to standard transmission vehicles. If you want to bump start them when that starter fails, here's what you do. Get inside, get the key in and turn the key on to the run position. That provides juice to the ignition and fuel system. All we're going to do now is use the transmission and a bit of forward motion to crank that engine over in lieu of the starter motor. Now we're fortunate that we've got a bit of a gradient in this parking lot. If you don't have a grade, you'll need some assistance to get you to push your vehicle and get a little bit of road speed. Key is on. I'm in second gear. Once I gain a little bit of road speed, I'm going to dump that clutch and I use the, the forward motion of the vehicle, the momentum of the vehicle, and dropping the clutch in second gear to get that engine turning over. I had the key on, so I had ignition and fuel delivery. All I had to do was crank it over a bit, and away it went. Now, some manufacturers recommend that you don't use this procedure, and believe me, if you don't feel comfortable with it and you can do it safely, don't attempt it. But I'm here to tell you, I've done it many times, and I've helped people do it. I feel conf confident with doing it, and believe me, if I'm the last guy in the parking lot at the cottage and my standard transmission won't start or I've killed the battery, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That's your Midas tip of the week. A portion of Motoring 98 is brought to you by the Solder Seal Gunk family of automotive products, makers of Puncture Seal Gold and Liquid Wrench. We're back with the new Hummer. It's equipped with a 6.5 liter turbocharged V8, 195 horsepower, 430 pounds feet of torque. Now we've always found the Hummer has two speeds, slow and slower, but with the new engine, and despite the 7,000 pounds, the Hummer has more than enough power for safe highway driving. Off-road, well there's little it won't go through or over. And yes, the diesel engine is noisy, but have you heard one that isn't? But now Hummer is offering an optional monsoon sound system designed for the Hummer. Six speakers and 200 watts of power. Now like most sport utility owners, the Hummer owners don't exactly go off-road very often. And Hummer believes the vehicle has received a bad rap for its on-road ability. So they challenge us to send it through a pylon course. Enter Dave Whitlock, the defending driving champion on the Cascar circuit. His task, put the Hummer 
through its paces. Just get her warmed up here. Give her a little more speed. How'd that go? Oh, not bad. <laughs> Well, I thought it was pretty neat. The guys were joking earlier on. They seen the Hummer sitting over here when they pulled in, and they were saying they'd like to take it for a test run. So when you come over and ask me, I thought that'd be pretty neat. I figured, uh, like, I know it's a pretty heavy vehicle, and it, it looks built low to the ground, so I thought it would, uh, you know, corner pretty good, but I didn't expect it to go through the, you know, through the pylons quite as well as it did. It'll, it'll go through there and stick pretty good. We actually had off-road tires on it, and they, the tires roll over quite a bit and had them squealing pretty good, but it, ha it handled quite well considering the size and the weight of it. When you really get it cornering fast, it seemed to want to, the rear end felt like it wanted to come around a little bit, like, but it, it, uh, you could go through there like as fast as you wanted to and it would stick. It just had a lot of tire roll, so it had pretty good pickup. You know, like it's the 6.5 it seemed to it seemed to pick up pretty decent for again like I'm kind of used to uh, you know race cars and that type of thing and you know they have better acceleration obviously but for the size of it I thought it had pretty good pickup it turns really short I was surprised that the, you know it, it turns right around pretty well on a dime it turns shorter than a lot of cars do Uh, seemed to handle pretty good on the asphalt. I wouldn't mind getting it off in the off-road conditions, but you guys wouldn't let me take it off there and give it a whirl. Hey, I would have loved to see Dave take the Hummer off-road. I'm just not too sure how Hummer might have felt about it. All right, now let's head to the garage. Join Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, you know, I've never understood the attraction of those Hummers. I see people driving them down the highway and driving them in the city, a military vehicle like that. There's something that, there's an old saying that comes to mind when I see them, and that's, uh, you need your head examined. Anyhow, speaking of getting your head examined, that's exactly what we're doing this week. Uh, last week in the shop, we had a vehicle came in with a complaint of erratic operation of the cooling system. And we looked at this thing once or twice prior to this and really couldn't come up with any good reason why the cooling system was working in an erratic fashion. We kind of suspected that there might be a problem in the top end of the engine, maybe a blown head gasket or a cracked casting. And sure enough, after we checked out all the basics, we looked at the rad, the water pump, thermostat, hoses, couldn't really find anything that would account for this situation. And the customer was complaining that uh, on occasion he'd have to add a couple of cups of coolant to the cooling system. He didn't find any major leak and it wasn't, there wasn't excessive smoke in the tailpipe and those are things that can, uh, can be characteristics or hallmarks of uh, a cracked cylinder head. Once we removed the cylinder head for closer inspection, things became pretty apparent. Now if you look at this combustion chamber here, that's a totally normal look. That reddish brown deposits that you see on there, that's totally normal combustion. Same thing in this cylinder here and I've removed the valve springs in this cylinder so the valves are open. But that, that look of the combustion chamber there is totally normal. Now when we get down to cylinder number four, you can see a totally different look. This white coloration here, uh, and this is what we had on our spark plug as well. That white coloration is a result of antifreeze getting in to and, and taking place in the combustion event in that cylinder. Now right here you can see some cracks in the cylinder head, there and there. And we had some cracks right in the combustion chamber as well. So uh, in addition to losing coolant, through these cracks. We were also, uh, with the cracks in the combustion chamber, getting engine compression, entering the cooling system, and air, air locking our, our cooling system. When we get down to cylinder number two, this combustion chamber right here, once again a totally normal look. This is normal combustion. But in cylinder number four with this white hue, that's a dead giveaway that we had antifreeze entering the cylinder. Now the valves out of this cylinder and all the other cylinders in this engine uh, the valves were okay, they'll, they'll be able to be reground and reinstalled in another cylinder head when we're doing a valve job. But the casting itself, due, because of these cracks and another crack in the combustion chamber, we're going to have to replace that casting in order to correct the problem with this engine. Hopefully you never are confronted with a situation like this, but if you ever overheat your engine, this is a distinct possibility. You'll have to get your head examined, literally. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 98.
I'll bet this traffic calming measure didn't calm that guy down very much. That's next on Kenzie's Corner. You know that I love to drive. I've even on occasion been known to drive fast. You get a car like that Z28 convertible on a twisty road on a beautiful day like this, and there's nothing like it. So you can just imagine what I think about concrete pillboxes in the middle of the street. Frankly, I think they're a great idea. Now, one thing traffic engineers have never quite come to grips with is that if they design a big, wide, straight street like this, people go fast. Well, duh. These concrete things are examples of what they call traffic calming measures, things like speed bumps, curbs sticking out into the street, even cobblestones, designed to slow traffic down. Now, many of the people that complain about these things live out in the suburbs. Well, the suburbs are designed around traffic. They've got their cul-de-sacs, they've got their stop signs, they've also got arterial roads designed to funnel traffic away from residential areas. The people who live out there seem to think nothing of coming into an inner city residential area like this and ramming through here at any speed they want. Now, frankly, We've talked to some of the residents in this area. They hate these things. They think they're ugly, which is true. They say that doesn't slow anybody down, but I'll bet you the guy that scraped his car against that thing isn't coming back to this street again, and that's the whole point. These streets really were designed for horses, not for cars anyway. But you know, if they really wanted to stop traffic here, they'd dig a one foot wide, one foot deep ditch right across the road. Those things really hurt. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, we've never had a lot of nice things to say about Hummers on motoring, but after spending a week with this 98 model, I've got two comments. One, if you're feeling a little ignored these days, drive a Hummer. You'll get all the attention you could possibly imagine. And secondly, even though I don't understand the sport utility market, if I was in the market and money was no object, this is the one I'd pick, simply because it's a lot of fun. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive loud, uplifted, angel trumpets blow. It was the last major introduction that we had was 18 years ago in 1980 with the Silver Spur. So it's a big, big occasion for us. TSN's Motoring 98 has been brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q stands for quality, always has, always will. And Midas for new, longer-lasting, performance friction carbon metallic brake pads.